parts of the government system, give different parts of us, Americans, and so on and so forth. Um, it's kind of an interesting way that we can actually collect this data uh, by actually going around, prompting certain questions, getting people to tell their own personal stories because history matters a great deal. It's one of the kind of boundary conditions that matter a great uh, deal to how people are going to respond. Um, and then actually have these people kind of basically self-analyze this data uh, so we can actually quantify, have them do this, uh, the quantification of it, and then start to look at patterns that start to develop. Um, here's a little simple device for doing that in, if uh, in this particular place is in Afghanistan, we use it in other parts of the world. Um, and then they actually score their own little story uh, in terms of, for example, this case we were asking at kind of like um, how, how much reprisal was actually underlying why you had that story that you were done in by earlier. Uh, so you could begin to actually look at the psycho and social dynamics of this particular group of people in a particular village, et cetera, et cetera. And you can start to map all this stuff out. Um, and you can start to actually do some, again, as you folks here understand, some amazing data analytics to begin to understand where there's stabilities in this culture and in this region and where there aren't. Um, now that's for the particular problems that um, uh, apply to, to the statecraft, streetcraft. What we're now looking at, back to the P4 type movements as well, how do we start to use these same tools to map out an entire city or map out an entire region? We're trying to understand exactly what really is going on in there that we might be able to move in and actually change certain behaviors with. Um, so let's get to that notion. Those are the probes, what are the modulators? These are the things you put into the system to actually bring about change. Um, again, biochemically, I'm not gonna sit here and tell you folks about that. Uh, I will talk a little bit more about the behavioral things in terms of how do we do games, gamification, how do we do texting for health, uh, coaching of a new form, et cetera, et cetera. I wanna whip through a set of examples of this so you get some sense of what is now becoming more and more possible. The simple sense of gamification in terms of games turn out to be an amazing, effective way uh, to change behavior because if you're a good game designer, and not, there aren't that many great game designers, but this whole notion of leveling up, how do you stay in the zone, how do you make something that is still stretches your ability to do this but still keeps you totally curious of what's the next stage and so on and so forth. Um, so how do you actually use all the ideas that we've developed in games uh, to think about actually changing behavior here. Um, you know, surprising a little bit to me, look at something as simple as texting for health. Uh, we just had a marathon here. Um, I've been very surprised at a half marathons, 12 mile marathons, how in fact, talking, interviewing people that are racing in, the, in these, how did the texting they're getting actually encourages them to constantly push themselves at the right moment when, when their coaches or whoever it is that they, uh, their superheroes are actually doing that for them. Uh, it's surprising that something as simple as that can make a difference. Perhaps a slightly deeper example is this new uh, um, game or activity called Super Better done by uh, Jane McConaughey, uh, who actually had a serious brain concussion uh, and basically ended up inventing a game for herself to play that it turned out to be the beginnings of bringing her back to health much faster than anybody ever thought possible. It's now being put out uh, for anybody to use. The game here, uh, the key to super better, is basically you defying a superhero for yourself. Who is your superhero? In her case, it was Buffy. No comments. Uh, uh, <laughs> if you know Jane, well, I won't go down that path. <laughs> but, but, um, and then you know, she started to kind of play out in her mind the role of Buffy. Uh, and then had several other superheroes that were meant to support Buffy that were her closest friends, her husband, two other people that she worked closely with, and then set up a set of challenges, leveled up, and so on and so forth, and proceeded actually with surprising recovery uh, rate to, to do this kind of recovery. Um, I'm not trying to argue that her one case is indicative of anything, but you begin to see here, now this has been kind of put around to a lot of people, something like this is actually starting to make certain kinds of behavior. So that's one class of modulators looking at gamification. But let's shift a moment to what I might call a second focus to the extreme quantified self. 
we all in this room understand the quantify self, um, but I want to go to um, kind of, you might call it a pathological example. <laughs> uh, Larry Smarr. Uh, uh, I don't know how many of you know Larry. Uh, he's a bit extreme, but, but uh, Larry's head of Cal IT2 uh, at uh, San Diego and at UC Irvine, um, among the probably key places of supercomputing fame and, and also some of the most interesting things they're doing in like 10 year type audacious goals. Um, Larry, it turns out, for those of you who don't know him deeply, uh, at 28 years old, conceived of the idea that he came from um, the National Lab doing highly classified work and went to the university and said, you know, we in the universities are using staying old, uh, stone age technology. What would it mean if we actually equipped our researchers with the best of the best of the best possible supercomputers? And he and several others wrote a proposal to NSF, said create five supercomputing centers. Uh, and I believe those are the five that actually started, much of the field were in here uh, as well. Um, but that's when NSF decided to start funding this. Um, so Larry has kind of an, uh, an interesting background. Um, and for one reason or another, he got really obsessed with going beyond my Fitbit. He said, John, Stone Age. Uh, and he wanted to take a measurement of everything. Uh, <laughs> so let me show you a three minute clip of Larry, if we can get this rolling. Quantified self, uh, to me it means tracking data about your body. As simple as weighing yourself on a scale once a day to as complicated as uh, wearing a device at night to measure every 30 seconds your sleep state to invasive measures that say, like your doctor will do a blood test and come back with 60 different things to look at. Uh, well, those are data about your body at the time the blood was taken. And then you can look at that over time. So the idea of having time series and being able to see how your, say, glucose changes over time, which diabetics have to monitor all the time, they're quantifying that aspect of their body. So then in that sense, they're becoming quantified self. And the reason you do this, you modify your behavior, and it's the same thing as if you're driving a car. You look at the speedometer, and if it's a 60 mile an hour zone, then you try to stay under 60. And so this idea of biofeedback altering your behavior so that you do get a desired goal is why people quantify themselves. If all that comes out of the quantified self is to get people to be more aware that they need more exercise and they need to eat less and more nutritious food, and we begin to back off the percentage of our population that is overweight or obese and therefore likely to become uh, diabetic, then that alone will have made a huge contribution to the future health of America. And it's the most important thing that can be done to reduce the deficit in the long term for this country, which is almost all going to be driven by health care costs. So that's just a short clip of him. It doesn't go into some of the more extreme things that he does. Uh, this article in Attic Monthly goes into it a little bit more. Um, he really does uh, keep all, I mean, many of his um, uh, stool movements and analyzes them. I mean, he's collecting data to the extreme. Um, but the catch to me is he's looking at data collection over time and looking at what can you really start to figure out from the trajectories of these things again uh, in a very serious way. Um, and I think what happened his own thinking, and also to my own thinking of this, is he did begin to realize more and more that his body, that now he could look at all the internal measurements, track through time, by the hour, by the week, by the month, and so on and so forth, different time scales, um, was his body was a complex system with its own dynamic, where again, very small changes could bring about huge effects. In fact, if you read the Atlantic Monthly article, I think it is in there, he actually had this aha moment because he also um, loves to keep his own um, coral system uh, uh, in, his, in his house. Uh, 
where he uh, discovered that by putting, it's about a 250 gallon tank that he has of this coral system, by putting five micro drops of a metallic element uh, into that, it completely changed the behavior of his coral system and began to realize how could I ever be able to predict either quantitatively that those tiny five drops would completely change over the next week or two or three, the entire dynamics of this ecosystem. Um, and I think for him, that was the wake up from a certain kind of physics that both he and I were trained in to beginning to realize that maybe we have to think about complex adaptive systems slightly differently. So okay, he's did all that. He's taken more measurements, you can believe, um, fanatic at that, blah, 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 blah. Um, but let's ask, what is he missing? Is there something more at stake here uh, that, uh, that we should be looking at in terms of an ecosystemic approach to health and wellness? Um, and I think the first answer, and there are two things I think he's missing. The first answer is yes. He's not paying much attention to the social context of his own self, um, et cetera. Um, that brings us back to a beautiful book uh, by Kritakis, Kritakis um, on how the health of my friends' friends' friends can actually have an influence on me. A summary, how your friends' friends' friends affect everything you feel, you think that you do. Um, a very interesting type of book that how our social networks that far removed, three links removed, could have this kind of impact on us. Um, in fact, you know, we might think about our own human superorganism in terms of networks of cooperation that lead to self-sustaining organisms, whether it be the cells in our body or human bodies in a neighborhood. So we have cells in a body on one side there, uh, it's definitely a complex system, and then the social context around it and the, the kind of boundaries between these two things are systems that feed into each other. Um, in fact, a very interesting example that um, you can look at in terms of how the friendship ties on Facebook can already give you tremendous prediction. Um, these kind of give you kind of clusters, clusters of people that are overweight, uh, both men and women and so on. You can start to factor the space in pretty interesting ways. Um, but what if the social context network, which you already have in front of you, is not robust enough to scaffold wellness, well-being, wellness? So it's one thing, again, to look at these vast networks and saying these vast networks influence our health, but we're looking at this game in order to bring about change. And so the catch is, can you actually start to rewire social networks toward the goal of wellness? Well, maybe yes. How might you introduce social bots into a semantic network, into a social network, I mean, uh, that actually starts to shape, actually alter the topology of that network? Um, this is a project that's being studied at the Web Ecology Project. Um, and they actually, in 2011, created a social bot competition. These are little agents, automated agents, that you can drop into a social network. They start conversing through Twitter, in this particular case, in that social network, and ask, how can it begin to, with those bots, how much could you actually change the topology of that network? again, aimed toward the wellness thing, for example. That's not what the competition was about. And in fact, when I first came across this, Peter Solovitz and I, uh, in the old, old days, were very much aware of ELIZA, uh, this amazing AI system uh, that play, pulled every trick in the trade to make you think that this person you were talking to on the old, old computers, 10Xs in those days, um, were actually a Rotarian therapist. Um, you could make these bots seem this way. But what about if we took those bots and actually embedded them into the social network? What might be possible? Well, I don't want to take you through all the details, but here is an example of day one, and then two weeks later, the ability to drop these social bots in and completely transform the topology of that social network. Um, that, some of us didn't believe 
was possible. Um, well, let me say it is possible. Um, there's a plus and a minus to that. Those social bots can be used for other purposes as well. Uh, these are fairly tricky things, but it does at least raise the question of how do we start using some of those ideas uh, to be able to shape things in order to bring about behaviors that we care about. Um, but what else might be missing? Um, well, I don't know if you've catched, caught it, but there was an amazing line uh, in, 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 in Larry's presentation, in the little video, when he showed a speedometer, and he said, well, you know, it's a speedometer, if, 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 the, if the limit is 60 miles an hour, and you're going over 60 miles an hour, you surely slow down, right? I mean, uh, and I laughed. I said, yeah, Larry, <laughs> I don't know what world you live in, but uh, <laughs> I pay very little attention to that. Um, so what actually, I mean, even if you show me the data, why does seeing the data myself change anything I really do? I'd like to think it does, and I do my, by the way, it's, uh, I mean, this does change my behavior a little bit uh, in obscure ways. Um, but data presented to people in their own rights don't change that much, by and large. Um, otherwise, diets would stay active much more longer, and so on and so forth. Um, so let's ask, might there be a way to think this game differently to affect behavior through what I might call participatory cognition? Affect behavior at scale, not just the individual. Could we potentially affect behavior at a large scale, understanding a new aspect of cognition, I'm gonna call it participatory cognition, and how might transmedia be used as a new tool for shaping context, and if you can shape context, broadly speaking, you can probably shape meaning. And so it's kind of an obscure notion of how do you shift from content, which we think about a lot in media, to context, and how, by doing that just right, might you actually start to shift meaning, especially if you can do it through participation. Um, first of all, what is transmedia? I'm not gonna go through this in any real detail, but transmedia kind of, to me, uh, I do some work in this now, uh, is storytelling, is a technique of telling a single experience, of course, in a very simple way, across multiple platforms and formats. Uh, for example, how do I take a story, move it from a movie to a game, uh, to a book, to a cell phone, blah, blah, blah. That's it in the simplest way. Um, but it involves creating content that engages the audience using various techniques to permeate their daily lives now, already that starts to shift a little bit. Multiple forms of medium delivering unique pieces of content in each channel. Let me just give you kind of diagrammatically. Um, of course, we can deliver media across multiple channels, um, but in what way can you do it so that the whole is much more than the sum of the parts and make that whole in a way that it actually starts to change the way you think and the way you actually act. Let me take two quick examples. Don't laugh, but Harry Potter is turning out to be a very provocative object to think with and to think about. Um, Harry Potter, um, if you look at the backstage, is a fantastic ex part of transmedia. What you have in Harry Potter is because you have the books and you have the movies and you have all the things we all know about but you have an amazing set of activities going on in the backstage where thousands, no, actually tens of thousands of kids are actually engaged in filling in the backstories, the backstage. They're actually engaged in a new form of close reading where they're trying to make sense out of why what happened happened or until the last one came out, what was gonna happen next and so on and so forth. For example, I keep being told, because I talk a lot about education in a lot of settings, that kids today don't read and they don't write. Well, obviously they read like mad, try to take a book on uh, Harry Potter away from a kid. Um, but most people are unaware that this backstage that I'm talking about has now had produced 1,500 novels of over 400 pages per novel by these kids in this backstage room that we're talking about. Something is really going on there very powerful. But let's move to something much more modern. 
Hunger Games, Hunger Games turned out to be a very interesting experiment in transmedia. Um, yes, it's a book. Yes, it's a movie. Yes, it's coming out in various ways. But in fact, with transmedia, with Hunger Games, you are allowed to participate in various activities that are always going on. You can actually log into, or you can sign up to be a citizen in one of the, of the districts. I, for example, am a citizen in District 2 in Hunger Games. <laughs> okay. uh, you participate in debates and all these kinds of things. So somehow now what's really happening is I'm beginning to get pulled into and participating in arguments and things like this in this world. Um, there's a whole new type of cognitive participatory activity that actually starts to shape certain kinds of behavior, but in this case, kind of superhero type behavior. The catch here is, how does this work more generally? How transmedia stories are told as facts, but more told, they are actually enacted as well. And that notion of the enactment is the part I just want us to dwell on a very brief second. Because if we can now use transmedia to actually have even soap operas of people that have certain types of diseases, et cetera, et cetera, in the transmedia world, you now start to take, play a role of those people. You start interacting with those people. You start now enacting part of what, how they are thinking. All of a sudden, you move from passively receiving information to actually participating with that. And through that cognitive participation, you start to have a different type of behavior. It's a very, I think, subtle set of activities going on here. Um, so for example, as I just kind of hinted, um, how do we actually use these transmedia, uh, maybe even to kind of trigger actions often off, off of key figures that the transmedia story itself might be about. Um, I don't take you much more into this, but there's, there's a lot going on here that is not being actively talked about, but I think is, is, is pretty powerful. So let me just step back and then let me ask, what is the bigger picture here uh, from my point of view? Um, and I think in a curious sort of way, what we're experiencing, and I was looking at it in the social dimension in terms of um, a lot of things we're doing with the games, et cetera, et cetera. Those are not big, huge projects. But rather, we're now entered as a new world, both in the social and in the technical worlds, where we got long tail science is now possible. We now have computing infrastructures serious computing infrastructures that enable 10-person garages in Silicon Valley to invent new materials, to invent new nanostructures, to invent new transistors, and to invent new types of games. Um, and if we had Carl um, Kesselman's group here, et cetera, from USC, you can now look at the fact that in terms of your own fields, you're finding thousands of small projects going on, um, generating tremendous data, that if we actually had a really good language of data, we might be able to take the agility and innovative thinking in these small experiments and see how the whole could be more than the sum of the parts. I think science is changing in the sense that there are still roles for the big fat part tail but now the infrastructures we're putting in place in terms of the types of tools we have enable amazing things to happen at the thin part of the tails and informatics itself and the ability to think new ways to combine data that hasn't been pre-designed in terms of a fixed ontology ahead of time. How do we actually let these things start to combine in ways where we have the best of the fat, big science and the best of the small sciences or the tiny slices that are really happening. I think we're about to see some amazing things. I work, as you probably gather, more in material science, and I can tell you the stuff that we have done in the last two or three years is simply mind-boggling in terms of being able to invent new nanomaterials, in my case, new types of uh, transistor technologies that are gonna change the way we see information in the near future. Um, but the real point, from my point of view, is we are, I think, at a Cambrian moment. That is to say that everything is up for grabs. We're now seeing virtually every part of our game disrupted. Um, 
we now are throwing it up. We have amazingly powerful tools. We're at a particular moment now that the bold, audacious goals we were talking about earlier, small moves, smartly made, can actually set very major things in motion. And I think that the whole idea of taking this Cambrian moment to reimagine healthcare using the emerging capabilities of sciences, informatics, and the social. And how might we even take this moment to think about how do we move from a focus just on sickness to a focus on wellness as well through the P4, blah, 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 blah. And how might we actually take the efflorescence of a Cambrian moment and see how we can really let that re anneal, so to speak, into a moment of human flourishing. With that, thank you. Thank, thank you, John. That was uh, excellent. Uh, very interesting and provocative. And it was uh, interesting to read the Twitter feed uh, go by. Um, so we're running a little bit behind schedule, but um, we have such a distinguished speaker here that I would like to take time for at least a few minutes of questions. And we'll ask the session chairs of the 3.30 sessions to um, you know, maybe give it five or 10 minutes uh, to get started. It's okay um, if you want. I I'm going to be here all day tomorrow as well, so you don't have to, I mean. Okay. 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 So, okay. Well, yeah. well, well why, why don't we maybe take, uh, is any one or two questions? There's microphones. Um. Do, do I see? Yes, okay. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll take a couple questions, and, and as uh, John says, he'll, he'll be around, so. Yeah. Uh, John, that was wonderful as, as usual. Um, I, I was at a meeting a couple of weeks ago where a bunch of doctors were sitting around bemoaning the fact that CMS is now going to penalize people for readmitting patients after they get out of the hospital too soon. And the, the, their argument was that uh, it's pretty predictable that the patients you wind up readmitting are the ones who are non-compliant. They are from poor socioeconomic backgrounds. Uh, they are not motivated to take care of themselves, and so within a short time after being uh, discharged, they're readmitted. Uh, the story you're telling, the opportunities that you're pointing out, I think are really terrific for the people who care. But what do you do about the people who don't care? Well, I think, you know, our challenge um, is everybody, for example, Paul, has, has a story. Um, if I took you into the, some of the worst places in Afghanistan, you'd say the same thing. Um, but if you let people tell their stories, you start to find points of resonance. And so we're not used to thinking about how do we couple into people who don't or already buy into our particular value system or for one reason or another. Um, what I'm beginning to see is we have an ability to listen in new ways, but I'm going to help design a course on just listening. <laughs> um, and this comes actually from a lot of work we're doing in the south side of the city called Chicago, <laughs> uh, where these kids now, we have them traveling on their own for an hour and a half you know, to come to the public library. Uh, and it's a question of how do we learn how to talk their language and to capture their imagination and engage and get them to enact a world. And so I'm very much involved with world building in terms of my work at USC. Um, you know, I, I think we have tremendous opportunities, but we've approached it from a top-down point of view, or this is our value system, and if it, if it doesn't jibe, we can't know how to connect. Good. Hi, I'm Deborah Ariosto. I wear the nursing informatics leader hat at Vanderbilt University Medical Center in Nashville. And as I looked at your S curve going to a J curve. And yep. I think about the institutions that probably a lot of us here come from, hospitals, we're moving, you know, the inpatient focus, now we're looking at the outpatient focus. But do you really think that we are able to break that mold and be that re-envisioning sort of body, or is that going to have to come from someplace else? When I think about people had talked about Ford were they in the transportation business or were they in the Model T business? And Kodak, the imaging, it just feels that we are so 
embedded in our current sort of paradigm that it would be very difficult to be that facile new organization with a different business model that could re-envision that health care. And if you think so, how do you think, what parts should we push on to achieve that change? Right. 